Welcome everyone to the Cyberphysics Podcast, where we unravel the complex web of cybersecurity through the lens of its foundational principles. I'm your host, and today, we embark on an intellectual journey that mirrors the intricacy of physics itself. Joining us are two remarkable experts, Rumgun Venkat Raman and Aaron Katz, as we delve into cyberphysics in essence. Good to meet you, and uh, maybe Aaron, maybe you can start with uh, your background, maybe just for the audience, and then we can just keep it free-flowing and uh, have fun with it. Sure. So my, bi- my background has pretty much just been in security since I started my career. I worked in, started ethical hacking, penetration testing, all of that fun, uh, moved to incident response, got tired of consulting and going to middle of nowhere uh, for way too many times, and moved to the industry where I built out application security and vulnerability management programs, moved to a larger enterprise where I not only built out the AppSec and vulnerability, but also the cyber defense, incident response, security operations, threat intelligence, automation, and then moved into a CISO role at a family office, and then currently at a cryptocurrency company. Fantastic. Sounds like a really good journey, especially doing offensive security, and then, you know, sort of transition. I think offensive security is sort of the best place to start. Um, You know, my daughter, who's also in our company doing security, I mean, she's learning both the defensive and the offensive security, and I think it's it's a great place to really begin one's career. And even as a company, Pinnacle focuses a lot on the defensive security. In fact, I love it more than even, I'll say, uh, for more than even the defensive security because offensive security, I think, allows you to think a lot out of the box um, in terms of how you can approach different problems. I, I think it teaches you phenomenal problem solving skills. Yep, absolutely. So, with that said, I mean, um, maybe you can. Um, Give uh, enlighten you know the audience with uh, some of the biggest problems you know in offensive security that you know uh, tends to hog us today. In your the biggest issues with offensive security, uh, people don't fix anything. That that's the biggest issue. Like there's not that you don't need to be that innovative. You don't need to run the latest and coolest zero days is you're not fixing stuff from years ago. That, what's the point? You know what? You hit the nail on the head. Man, you know, is that an issue? We work with customers day in and day out. And, uh, you know, in fact, the, 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 the longest, uh, you know, uh, portion of that uh, is, is the entire ability to remediate and take action. Um, you know, and even, you know, configuration issues, you know, are another huge blind spot because you can have a door, you, you, can, you can build a good door and you, the door may open and close well, but what if you let the door open when you're supposed to leave it closed? And, um, you know, that's another area that we see as a huge opportunity. You know, how Capital One had a, a misconfiguration in their uh, web application firewall that left the door open instead of it being closed. And then, of course, Privileged access to moment created the, the next level of challenges. Yep. So, so maybe you can tell, you can enlighten everyone with you know maybe some tools about how would you why do you think we, you know companies don't fix it? Maybe that's you know the next segue there. I mean, companies don't fix it for a variety of reasons. I think the biggest issue is that security and operations are typically completely separate. So you have security as kind of a dictator telling people to do things, but it's not their team that actually does the fixing. Typically, they're not involved in the testing of those patches or understanding of what it takes to fix it. All they do is just say, here's a ton of problems, go fix it. They don't prioritize it or have a kind of skin in the game on making sure it actually gets fixed. I I think that's a big problem. And then the other problem is, I mean, kind of tying into that prioritization and understanding where those issues are. Do you know every single device on your network that'll need the patch? If it's code based, do you know how to deploy it safely and how quickly you can deploy it and where it's all located? Without a good inventory and understanding of what you have and what it takes to fix, 
it's not going to happen, especially if it's something like a network device or your VM hypervisor. It makes total sense. I think, um, you know, um, so do you think DevSecOps, you know, has any, uh, um, any path to fixing this issue of uh, separation of security and ops? I think it's more of a management issue. The concept of DevSecOps makes sense. The problem is the way it's really been interpreted is you still have security as kind of that blocker. So you have developers who are pretty much full stack, creating the back end, creating the front end, owning the infrastructure now. But then security either still puts in those gates without starting earlier in the design and architecture phase. So you have people that are moving along, they're ready to commit their code, they're ready to deploy, and then security stops them and makes them wait sometimes days or weeks to run scans every time. And that's not efficient anyways and there's no automation there so having security teams enable the development side where you defer some of the decision making to the devs but you give them the tools they need that they could run the test themselves they kind of get their bible of sorts of what you can and can't do give them the guidelines let them have ownership it'll move a lot faster than when security kind of plops in the way makes again total sense um maybe you can share how you have been addressing it you know in the organizations that you're associated you don't have to name them or anything but you know in general you know what how have you converted if you have converted some of these limitations into your strengths or if that is still work in progress depending upon you know what you're doing i'll say it's still a work in progress but what we've done that's been pretty successful is there's joint ownership with operations and security. It's not operating in a silo or operating in a tower. If we're implementing an asset management tool, an asset management system, so we know what we have and what the issues are, the operations team has been involved in understanding what is that tool? How do we use it? They get access to it. When it comes to security tooling, we share access in certain, in certain ways so that they're able to actually see what the issues are without having to wait on us all the time. The biggest barrier that we've had that we've had to break down is this silo us versus them mentality. If we started giving access, we, we started noticing people are fixing things faster, they take more ownership, and we treat security issues, especially in code, as just another bug. We prioritize it properly, it goes in the sprints properly, it's just another bug. Sometimes it's a break fix and you have to drop everything and fix it, and sometimes it can wait till the next sprint as long as we're judicious in how many times we throw fire onto the, they're fine. So which parts are still in progress in your view? Thoroughness is the part that's in progress. There's a lot of legacy and making sure that we can, if you're having an application that you're really not committing code to, except maybe a couple times a year, it's still running, you still have to do something about it. So really trying to tackle all of these high hanging fruits, but the ones that can cause impact to us is, it's tough. See, um, we are a platform, you know, cybersecurity platform company. And, you know, of course we do solutions as well as platforms. And one of the reasons, I mean, you know, for this podcast and many things is to actually assess um, various problems that we can essentially consider. There are problems we consider, there are problems that we still have to consider. So for me, this was enlightening because I do you know, you know, appreciate your point of view on that aspect of how to go after remediation. And you know, one of the things I do want to explore more you know, you know, you know, in ensuing conversations is you know, I want to lay out some problems to you and show you how we have been addressing it, mostly to get your input because uh, you know, you know, in the offensive and the preventive, which is, uh, you know, fixing, you know, issues, there are a lot of problem statements that are still yet to be solved. And uh, we are interested in those, you know, green spaces and white spaces and gray spaces, which, you know, still exist. So I want to, you know, you know, perhaps maybe, you know, have a conversation with you, you know, around how we have, for example, looked at threat intel and how we have sort of connected it to, you know, these remediation issues. And, 
you know, maybe refine those problems a bit more because the way I look at a problem is if I speak to 50, 60 customers and all of them seem to have the same kind of issue, then it's a problem worth going after because you're evaluating problem product market fit, in other words. So love to, you know, get your take and uh, input, advice, whatever you have, because this is how we want to really refine the problem statements that we go after, because you want to go after the biggest problems that have the highest impact rather than pick a problem that is very narrow and only affects just a few people. I want to say, okay, what's the largest impact and the largest coverage it can have. So based on this conversation, right, one thing that we could really look at is how do we go after problems, which, you know, could be where you have cultural barriers, how can you integrate dev second ops in a way that it is completely seamless, where it is truly one. The reason for that name dev sec ops is, 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 is a unicorn. It's one rather than segmented. And what is a product that can integrate that so that security doesn't become an afterthought, but an actual glue, like the word it's supposed to be, right? Sec is right in between dev and ops. And so it is expected to be a glue rather than a, uh, you know, and, and a glue and an enabler, not, you know, like a blocker, like it's how it's traditionally seen. So it'll be really good to have that and share with you, you know, certain things that we're doing on threat intel and things like that, just to get your input. It'll be really fun. Yeah, sure. <laughs> now, blockchain. So, you know, always known, <laughs> always known to be, uh, you know, um, you know um, in the news for the right reasons and the wrong reasons. Um, and uh, since you're part of a cryptocurrency and with FTX and other companies, you know, gone in a, in, a, in, a, in a matter of no time, what is your perspective, you know, and what do you think um, should be the next, um, you know, application? And is blockchain uh, hopefully helpful in actually helping with the next gen, you know, attack surfaces? Is it just going to get more problems? You know, what, what do you think? Uh, what is your sort of perspective, opinion, prophecy, whatever you want to call it? Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on it. I'm going to be very brief on it just because I don't want to talk too much because I got to keep that work side separate. But I think you don't have to talk about your work. Don't talk about your work at all. It's just, you know, uh, it, it has to be just industry, you know, wise. Yeah. I think there's applications for blockchain. I personally have not really seen many cases where blockchain was implemented where something else couldn't have done the same thing. Uh, there's been some interesting cases in the financial space where blockchain is used in an interesting manner, but it took advantage of being private instead of public, which is where people think of blockchain, where you have public, you don't trust anything, so therefore you have all of these disparate nodes that come together and say, yes, this is good or not. But then you have banks that are using it internally to just track the movement of money. Use smart contracts as promissory notes, and instead of having to rely on actually moving funds back and forth, which can take time, send a token that has a promissory note that says you are entitled to X funds. Did you need to use blockchain? No, but the auditing for that is actually very nice. It's easy and it's very quick to set up. So we're seeing some interesting applications in the market. I'm still not convinced that we've really seen cases where it could only have been solved with blockchain. Got it. Well, that's a very good insight. Um, no, I think uh, that's another problem statement that we're going after. Um, again, would love to, you know, you know, pick your brain and have more discussions around that. Um, again, you know, uh, it, it's it is it's a great opportunity to meet other people in this industry and pick your brain on different things. And I think collectively, you know, one of the reasons we have chosen cybersecurity as a problem to go after is because the problem keeps growing. So in order to solve the problem, you actually have to grow in size relative to the problem. So we chose, a, we chose a domain where the problem size is big and it continues to grow, you know, incrementally and, and more so exponentially. And that's why cybersecurity has always been a, a love affair for us. So we'd love to, you know, talk to you more about threat intel, encryption, blockchain, and a few other things. Uh, and we can also show you the work we are doing. So, you know, love to get 
any inputs that uh, you know you may have. Sure. So look forward to more, uh, you know, Aaron. I'll have uh, Isabella or Kimberly set up a follow up, and then we'll go through it. And would love to, you know, uh, pick your brain. Sounds good. Thank you so much for your time. We look forward to talking to you soon. No problem. Take care. Thanks. Bye. As we wrap up this enlightening episode of the Cyberphysics Podcast, we want to express our deep appreciation to our insightful guests, Rungan Venkat Raman and Aaron Katz, for sharing their wisdom with us today. Cyberphysics, in essence, has indeed brought us closer to understanding the intricate forces that govern our digital world. We hope you've gained valuable insights and inspiration to navigate the ever evolving landscape of cybersecurity. Stay connected, stay informed, and remember, the essence of cyberphysics is ever-present in our connected reality. Until next time, keep exploring and seeking the equilibrium between innovation and safeguarding. Thank you for joining us on this captivating journey.